Hello America, this is Call of Duty Goddess. Today is October the 5th, 2016. It seems that on September 28th, the House Judiciary Committee grilled James Comey over the non-prosecution of the Clinton cartel. So let's delve into this with Lou Dobbs, shall we? We, as Congress and the American people, are troubled how such gross negligence is not punished and why there seems to be a different standard for the politically well-connected, particularly if your name is Clinton. Well, our first guest tonight says evidence of a cover-up involving Mills and others is, as he puts it, compelling. Joining us tonight, Congressman Jim Jordan, member of the Judiciary Committee. He also serves on the Oversight Committee. He is the chairman of the Conservative Freedom Caucus. Congressman, great to see you, and thanks for being here. Good to be with you, Lou. I have to say, I, I'm, I'm stunned uh, yeah. hearing uh, uh, Comey say uh, this was done the way you would want it done when, when you all made it pretty clear you didn't think it was quite right. Uh, what's your reaction to what he said and what uh, the conclusion we should all take from this hearing? There are two standards. Everyone in America knows it. There's one standard for you and me, and there's a different standard for the politically connected. Mr. Comey, in his opening statement, Lou, said that th this was an unusual case. That's the understatement of the year. Of course it was an unusual <laughs> case. The, the, the husband of the subject of the investigation meets with the attorney general three days before you interviewed the subject of the investigation. So Bill Clinton met with Attorney General Loretta Lynch three days before the investigation took place with Hillary Rodham Clinton. Let's check into the relationship between the Clintons and Loretta Lynch. In 1999, President Bill Clinton nominated Loretta Lynch for the first of her two terms as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York, a position she held until she joined Hogan and Hartson in March of 2002. Loretta Lynch was the litigation partner for eight years with Hogan and Hartson, the law firm that served the Clintons. She was there from 2002 to 2010. According to documents Hillary Clinton's first presidential campaign made public in 2008, Hogan and Hartson's New York-based partner, Howard Topaz, was the tax lawyer who filed income tax returns for Bill and Hillary beginning in 2004. Now, according to the Washington Post from this May 3, 2010 article, Hogan and Hartson merged with Lovells, which then created Hogan Lovells, which is, as you can see here, a partner with Howard M. Topaz. Congressman Trey Gotti also pressing Comey further about the immunity granted specifically to Cheryl Mills. Mills, of course, is the Clinton aide, top aide, who walked out of an FBI interview when it went into an area that she didn't want it to go, and who sat in on the FBI interview after being given immunity, that interview conducted with Hillary Clinton. And Clinton's personal lawyer, Cheryl Mills, got a deal, it turns out, that was much broader than previously reported. It shields her from prosecution for obstruction of justice as well as the destruction of government records. And there was no consequence when classified information was found on her laptop, Lou. So why is Cheryl Mills getting preferential treatment by the FBI and perhaps the DOJ? Let's check out Cheryl Mills' relationship with the Clintons. I'm at a Washington Post article from 1999. According to this article, Cheryl Mills was 27 and a member of the Bar Association for two years. She was an associate at Hogan and Hartson when she joined the presidential transition team in 1992. Bill Clinton had not yet been elected, but things looked good enough to begin planning. Six years later, she is a senior member of the Office of White House Counsel. So in 1998, Cheryl Mills received a promotion to senior White House Counsel. Just so happens that during the 90s, the Clintons were involved in many controversial situations, including Whitewater, the impeachment trial, affairs, perjury, missing documents, the whole nine yards. And soon after that, 
you have Hillary Clinton's bid for the New York Senate seat. Yes, the Clinton cartel was in major cover-up mode. I'm in an archived article from Media Research, dated January 28, 1999, titled Cheryl Mills, Liar, Obstructor, or Heroin. After Deputy White House Counsel Cheryl Mills defended the President before the Senate on January 20th, the media touted a new star. But almost none of them mentioned that she's facing her own investigation for perjury and obstruction of justice. On November 6th, 1997, just one year prior to her big promotion, Mills admitted to the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee that she and White House Counsel Jack Quinn withheld documents for 15 months, including a memo suggesting Clinton wanted the $1.7 million White House Office database shared with the Democratic National Committee. Last fall, Representative David McIntosh asked the Justice Department to investigate Mills. Neither of these stories made the networks then or now. And then we have from the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee's October 1998 report on an investigation into the White House Office database titled, Why the Clintons Love Mills. The committee believes that there is substantial evidence that in September 1996, then associate, now deputy counsel to the president, Cheryl Mills, with the knowledge and concurrence then of White House counsel Jack Quinn, knowingly and willfully obstructed the investigative authority of this committee by withholding documents that were plainly responsive to the committee request for documents and information. Moreover, when this obstruction was brought to light in a hearing before the committee, Miss Mills lied under oath about the documents and the circumstances surrounding their non-production. This woman, Cheryl Mills, has no business in the White House. She should not be counsel to Hillary Clinton. And no wonder she has been given all of these free passes so she won't be charged with obstruction of justice and destruction of government records. She is a national security risk. Cheryl Mills is doing the same thing she did 20 years ago for the Clintons. A lady who got immunity deal as well, a partial immunity deal. Five people get immunities. Five people get immunities and no one gets prosecuted. Three of those people who got immunities came in front of Congress and took the fifth. And one of those three didn't even come in front of Congress the second time, even though he was subpoenaed. He just said, I'm not even going to show up. And the clincher, the attorney general announces before the recommendations are there that she's going to follow Director Comey's recommendation and she don't even, doesn't even know what they are. So this is the most unusual thing we've ever seen. And of course people are upset about it because it's supposed to be equal treatment under the law for everybody. You don't get something special just because you're the nominee of a major party, just because you're former first lady, just because you're secretary of state, just because you're a former senator. That's not how it's supposed to work in this country. And everyone understands that. Everyone understands that, but Hillary Clinton and the Clinton cartel. I'm at an article titled, Comey has a long history of letting the Clintons off the hook, and that's from July 5th, 2016. You see, this isn't the first time that Comey has let the Clintons slide. Back in 2002, James Comey was the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York and was investigating a case involving the Clintons, and suddenly, with very little explanation, closed the case. The case was concerning the infamous New Square Four, who were convicted of bilking the government out of tens of millions of dollars. Where the Clintons come in is that former President Bill Clinton reduced the sentences of the four Hasidic Jews from New Square in Rockland County, north of New York City. The move was controversial because Hillary Clinton had campaigned in the Hasidic village on the suggestion of her staff. The campaigning, in fact, did pay off as she grabbed 1,400 votes compared to 12 votes for her opponent, Rick Lazio. The eye-popping margin of victory in that community was far greater than the vote total she received in other similar 
nearby communities. The village leader's aggressive courting of the president and Mrs. Clinton before and after the 2000 Senate election raised questions of whether the men's sentences were reduced in exchange for votes. An investigation into the New Square 4 case was announced in 2001 by Mary Jo White of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan, although at the end of the 15-month investigation, James Comey said, The investigation was closed because we thoroughly investigated and determined it wasn't appropriate to bring charges against anybody in the case, Mr. Comey said at a news conference in an unrelated case. I can't really go into it because it was an investigation investigation that didn't result in charges. That may be a frustrating answer, but that's the one I'm compelled to give. So Comey closed this case, but there's more to the Clinton connection. Comey was the top prosecutor in New York after being appointed by George Bush and as an incoming gift was now in charge of the criminal investigation into the 176 last-minute pardons that Bill Clinton had made as he was walking out of the White House. Many of the pardon recipients had donated to Hillary Clinton's 2000 Senate campaign and also to the Clinton's presidential library and allegedly in exchange were granted pardons. But despite the evidence, Comey surprisingly found no criminal wrongdoing. Now what I find odd in this situation is that George Bush placed James Comey in the position of being the Southern New York District Attorney in 2002. A district attorney is granted wide discretion with regard to deciding whether to prosecute, what charges to file, and whether to permit a plea agreement. It looks as though George Bush and Bill Clinton were working together at that time. And to see yeah. the targets, the targets of an investigation being granted immunity, I, I mean, Cheryl Mills is the number two target uh, if yeah. there is to be an investigation and prosecution and he's and he gives away immunity. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That, that Lou, that list I just gave actually gets worse because one of those individuals who, who got immunity and then took the fifth in front of Congress, Paul Combetta, right. was actually caught last week going online and trying to delete his Reddit post, post where he talked about a very VIP person who didn't want her email address exposed, right? That person's right. obviously Secretary Clinton. In fact, Director Comey admitted today that that Reddit post from back in 2014, that VIP that he was referring to was Secretary Clinton, and the they wanted to make sure this email address didn't go public. The they in that Reddit post, I'm convinced, is Cheryl Mills. And yet he still says, we're not going to reopen this investigation. We did a great job, and the case is closed. Combetti recently took the fifth on the Hill after he destroyed the Clinton email archive and also tried to destroy his online request for help on Reddit, wiping Clinton's email address from the records. But he lied to an FBI agent. You don't think that's important? And Comey confirmed there was no consultation with Congress about the five immunity deals that could ultimately derail their ongoing investigations. Speaking of the Clinton cartel and destruction of evidence, we have the infamous Sandy Berger. Let's find out about him, shall we? One of those making sure that nothing happened to Bill Clinton's poll numbers to make him vulnerable to being removed from office just happened to be the person at the epicenter of the path to 9-11 controversy, his national security advisor, Sandy Berger. Berger represented the Clinton administration in sworn testimony before the 9-11 commission. In preparation for his testimony, Berger visited the National Archives, stole classified documents, and stuffed them into his pants and socks. Within a stone's throw of the Justice Department, he then hid them under a construction trailer and later destroyed them with a pair of scissors. After originally claiming with a straight face that it was all just an honest mistake, Berger pled guilty to a misdemeanor. He paid a $50,000 fine and lost his security clearance for three years, which incredibly would have made him eligible to serve in a Hillary Clinton administration, whose 2008 presidential campaign he advised. Now, everything that was said just now was based on Sandy Berger's testimony. Sandy Berger is the one that said that he took the papers and put them under a trailer. I believe, as many others do, that Sandy Berger did not work alone, but he didn't rat out anyone. There are others, I believe, in the Clinton cartel 
who worked alongside of Sandy Berger, who took the papers instead of him putting them under a trailer. That is a load of BS. In fact, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform did a report on this, and it's probably all a load of BS because the investigation is based on what came out of Sandy Berger's mouth, which is nothing but a pack of lies. So let's take a closer look at Sandy Berger. He died December 2nd, 2015 of cancer. He was Bill Clinton's National Security Advisor from 1997 to 2001. He worked as a partner in the Washington law firm of Hogan and Hartson from 1973 to 1977. He then took the post of Deputy Director of Policy Planning at the State Department in the Jimmy Carter presidency. After Carter lost his bid for re-election, Berger returned to Hogan and Hartson, where he worked until taking leave in 1988 to act as foreign policy advisor for Michael Dukakis's presidential campaign. When Dukakis was defeated, Berger again returned to Hogan and Hartson until his friend Clinton ran for president in 1992. Looks as though Berger is also a member of a secret society called Quill and Dagger. Berger also advised Hillary Clinton while she was Secretary of State, as you can see in this leaked email from September 22nd, 2009, in reference to Netanyahu. I do believe that there is more than one leaked email from Sandy Berger to Hillary Clinton. I cannot yeah. understand, and I don't believe many of the American people can believe or understand that we've got a director of the FBI who presented with these facts has basically said, go to hell. Uh, I'm going to give immunity to who I want. It doesn't have to make sense to those who have oversight of the director of the FBI and his agency who, yeah. uh, I, I mean, you're, you're supposed <laughs> to be a co-equal branch of government. And right now we see you basically, well, uh, you know, you've been run over. Well, they're, they're, look, there are all kinds of great people who, who have worked and still work and, and, and do work for the FBI, and we appreciate the service oh, they absolutely. provide. I am I'm talking about at the, the top, because there can't be that many and, people at the top. No one has resigned. No one has said this is a yep. bunch of crap. Well, with all due respect, Mr. Dobbs, someone did resign, and that's in this article by True Pundit titled Exclusive FBI Used Agents as Pawns to Insulate Hillary Aids and Clinton Foundation from Prosecutions. John Giacalone was the supervisor of the Bureau's National Security Branch and also the FBI brains and genesis behind the Clinton email and private server investigation. He first approached Comey in 2015 for the green light to probe how the former Secretary of State operated her private email server and handled classified correspondences. Rumors have been swirling at intelligence circles once approved. Gia Cologne spearheaded the investigation and helped hand select top agents who were highly skilled but also discreet. Many of those agents were concerned when Gia Cologne abruptly resigned in the middle of the investigation. FBI insiders said Gia Cologne used the term sideways to describe the direction the Clinton probe had taken in the Bureau. Gia Cologne lamented privately he no longer had confidence in the direction the investigation was headed. He felt it was simpler to quietly step aside, walk away instead of fight to keep the investigation on its proper track. Gia Cologne was a true heavyweight agent at the FBI. In fact, he likely should have been running the entire show. His pedigree included running and creating FBI divisions in New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and even serving as deputy commander in the Iraqi theater of operations. But in the midst of the Clinton investigation, Gia Clone handed the Bureau his retirement papers in February. John is a strategic thinker. He recognizes patterns and signs and can then see things long before they develop, a FBI insider said. Losing him was a major blow. We now know perhaps what he was envisioning. He didn't want that around his neck. Not only did the top investigator of the Clinton cartel take an early retirement from the investigation, but there's a special gag order placed on FBI agents that are involved in investigating the Clinton cartel. 
Let's have a look at this. Breaking tonight and reported for the first time on Fox News, new details on the intense secrecy imposed on FBI agents working the Hillary Clinton email probe. Investigators were forced to sign rare non-disclosure agreements, one Republican congressman going so far as to call them gag orders uh, on FBI agents. Plus, new reporting from the New York Post tonight, an FBI source saying some in the agency believe that days before the FBI announcement when Attorney General Loretta Lynch met privately with former President Bill Clinton, they struck an inside deal to clear Mrs. Clinton, sourcing FBI agents on that. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge has the report live tonight in Washington. Catherine? Megan, an intelligence source close to the FBI investigation said the decision not to recommend criminal charges was, quote, a demoralizing blow, adding the bar was set so high by the Justice Department that there was no way FBI agents could cross that threshold. And tonight we are learning more about how these agents were sworn to secrecy. The FBI has confirmed to a senior Republican senator that agents were asked to sign this form called a case briefing acknowledgement, which says the disclosure of information is strictly prohibited without prior approval, and those who sign are subject to lie detector tests. The Republican chairman of the powerful Senate Judiciary Committee, Chuck Grassley, first wrote to the FBI director in February about the issue. And in a new letter reviewed by Fox News, Grassley is highly critical of Director Comey's recommendation against criminal charges, given the evidence he made public. In light of all of these inconsistencies, it is even more troubling that the FBI tried to gag its agents with a non-disclosure agreement on this matter, in violation of whistle lower protection statutes, Grassley said. Only after I wrote to you did you advise your FBI agents that they are still free to speak with Congress regarding waste, fraud and abuse. Last week in his nearly five-hour testimony on the Hill, Director Comey said he had anticipated some of the blowback over his recommendation and he recommitted to full disclosure. I understand people's questions and interest and I, I, I'm a huge fan of transparency. I think that's what makes our democracy uh, great. The FBI told the senator these agreements are not unique, but what we don't know tonight is when agents were asked to sign them and when they were told they could still speak out and go to Congress if there was a conflict, Megan. I'm frustrated as well, and I think so many people are, Lou. Uh, one of the other things that so frustrated me was when it was brought to Director Comey's attention that Secretary Clinton made false statements in front of the Benghazi committee last October, <laughs> statements that turned out to every inaccurate statements as evidenced by what he discovered in his investigation, and yet he said they didn't even look at that. Now think about it. The subject of your investigation, Secretary Clinton, is testifying in front of Congress, being asked about the very subject matter, her email situation, that you're looking into, and you don't look at the transcript from that, from that hearing? Speaking of Benghazi, former Deputy Chief of Mission, Mr. Hicks, was visited by some members of Congress during an investigation of the Benghazi attacks. Listen to what took place, according to Mr. Hicks. As I read the transcript, it seems to me that it came to a head in phone calls you were on with lawyers from the Department of State prior to Congressman Chaffetz coming to visit in Libya. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And tell me about those conversations, what those lawyers instructed you to do on Mr. Chaffetz's visit to Libya. I was instructed not to allow the RSO, the Acting Deputy Chief of Mission, and myself to be personally interviewed by Congressman Chaffetz. So the people at state told you, don't talk to the guy who's coming to investigate? Yes, sir. Said, don't Not talk personal. with the congressman? Now, you've had, you've had several congressional delegations come to various places you've been around the world. Has that ever happened where lawyers get on the phone to you prior to a congressional delegation coming to investigate a time when we've had four Americans lose their lives? Have you ever had anyone tell you, don't talk with the people from Congress coming to find out what took place? Never. Never. And you've had dozens and dozens of congressional delegations that you've been a part of. Yes, sir. First time it's ever happened. Yes, sir. Tell me about, and, and also, is, isn't it true that one of those lawyers on the phone call accompanied the folks on the delegation and, and tried to be in every single meeting you had with Mr. Chaffetz and the delegation from this committee? Yes, sir. That's true. Tell me what happened when you got a classified briefing with Mr. Chaffetz. What happened and the phone call that happened after that? The lawyer was excluded from the meeting because his clearance was not, was not high enough and the delegation had insisted that the briefing not be limited by any... Did the lawyer try to get in that briefing? He tried, yes, but the, 
uh, annex chief and, and uh, would not allow it because the briefing needed to be at the appropriate level of clearance. And you, you had a subsequent conversation after this classified briefing that the lawyer was not allowed to be in, with you and Mr. Chaffetz and others on that delegation. And you had a, another conversation on the phone with Cheryl Mills. Tell me who is Cheryl Mills? She was counselor for the Department of State and chief of staff to Secretary Clinton. That is a pretty important position? Yes, sir. When she calls, you take the phone call? That's immediately. Yeah, she's, she's, she's the fixer for the Secretary of State. She is as close as you can get to Secretary Clinton. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. And tell me about that phone call you had with Cheryl Mills. Uh, a phone call from that senior person is, generally speaking, not considered to be good news. And what did she have to say to you? Uh, she in, demanded a report on the visit. Was she upset by the fact that this lawyer was not, this, this was upset. babysitter, this spy, whatever you want to call him, was not allowed to be in that? First time it's ever happened, all the, all the congressional delegations you've ever entertained was not allowed to be in that classified briefing. Was she upset about that fact? She was very upset. So this goes right to the person next to Secretary Clinton. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, here's a guy with 22 years of outstanding service to our country, 22 years outstanding service, praised by everybody who counts, the President, the Secretary, everyone above him. And yet now they are obstructing it because he won't, he won't help them cover this up. He is an honorable man here telling the truth. Now is getting this kind of treatment from the very people who praised him before. I, the, who, what kind of investigation is that? So that is also all these things together. When you, when you make the list, you are like, I have never seen anything like this. And this from, as Mr. Gowdy pointed out today in the hearing, from an agency that, that had so much respect, that is what is troubling to, uh, to so many Americans. Well, Mr. Jordan, with all due respect, this is why the public does not trust Congress because of the very simple fact that in 2007 the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, the very committee that you are on, made this report on Sandy Berger's theft of classified documents. There were many unanswered questions. He is connected with the Clinton cartel. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight is also the very same committee in 1998 that makes the scathing report on Cheryl Mills, committed perjury and destroyed documents. The very same committee. You are saying, sir, that this is unprecedented. Please tell me that you do know about this. Please. I don't want to fault Mr. Jordan for not doing his job. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there is a pattern here and something needs to be done about it, especially with Cheryl Mills. There's a report on her in your committee that was done before you were there. I understand that, but you can look it up just like I did. So maybe you know about this. Maybe you're trying to get to the bottom of this. I certainly hope so. But the people really need the members of Congress right now. Now it's no big secret that the Bushes and Clintons have been very close for a very long time. The media is just now letting the cat out of the bag. But it's easier to unravel this tight web of deceit when you realize that the Clintons and Bushes have been working together all along. So, in my part two of this series of the Clinton cartel, actually, we'll call it the Clinton Bush cartel, we will look more in to this cartel and hopefully we can find the ringer or ringers that are in the crowd. The ringer being the person placed in to a strategic place to cover for the Clintons and the Bushes. And maybe, with a little luck, we can point them out and I can show you who they are. You may be able to start getting an idea just from watching this video. So look out for part two of the Clinton cartel. This is Call of Duty Goddess signing off and as always, I've got your six.